Welcome to The Doc Dudes, your premier podcast for a behind-the-scenes look at the latest in aesthetic medicine. Hosted by the cosmetic surgeons at Graper Harper Cosmetic Surgery in Charlotte, North Carolina, The Doc Dudes brings you interviews with insightful guests, expert tips from experienced medical professionals, and lots of laughs along the way. And now, here's Dr. Garrett Harper and Dr. Robert Graper, also known as The Doc Dudes. All right, welcome to another episode from The Doc Dudes. This is uh, Dr. Garrett Harper here with Dr. Bob Graper, and we are excited tonight because we're going to talk all things skincare, specifically the difference between over-the-counter preparations and medical grade. We get a ton of patients that ask um, all about skincare because it's the largest organ in the body, and I think Dr. Graper, like myself, tells every patient that the most important thing they can get out of any talk we ever give is to take really good care of their skin. Sunscreen. Sunscreen and all sorts of stuff. So we'll kind of get into the nitty gritty. And thankfully, because um, we are certainly proficient in it, but not experts, we've got somebody with us today, Dr. Alisar Zar, PhD. And I'm going to embarrass her. She's in Dallas, Texas right now. Big D, little A, double L, A, S. But uh, Dr. Zar, say hello to everybody. Hello, everyone. So happy to be here. I'm I want to know how somebody evening. gets to be the senior director of research at uh, Revision Skincare. Oh, we're going to get to that. Are we? Oh, we're going to get to that. Promise. But right now, <laughs> I'm actually going to read her bio because this is impressive. So I want people to know that that they are actually dealing with an expert and not just a bunch of uh, uh Two vagabonds here. So Dr. Alice Arzar is the Senior Director of Research and Clinical Development at Revision Skincare, one of my wife and mine's favorite skincare lines, which is great. She's responsible for product innovations, formulation, and conducting clinical studies for new product launches as well as marketed products. She is responsible for a team of clinical scientists focused on disruptive innovation and measurable clinical results. Dr. Zar collaborates with marketing, international, domestic, and strategic sales to ensure the product innovations and benefits can be translated to physicians, their staff, and patients. She is considered a subject matter expert in formulation of sun care products, as well as anti-aging, which every single person that's listening to this podcast will be interested in. Throughout her career in the personal cosmetics industry, she's formulated and successfully brought products to the market like Neutrogena, I remember that in college. Rock, Clean and Clear, Avino, and Elta MD, which is another great um, sunscreen line. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, we use a lot of that. As evident from Dr. Zar's prior work experience, she's passionate about cosmetics and focused on creating products for healthy, beautiful skin. Now, here's the fun part. (laughs) She received her Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering. She is a self-proclaimed nerd, which is great, at Villanova University and her PhD in chemical engineering. PhD is the highest level of education and degree you can obtain in the United States of America. Can you believe that? Way higher than a medical degree, PhD. Uh, Are you sure about that? I'm positive on that because I used to have an attending, uh, Bob Martindale, who used to tell us that because he was the only general surgery attending that was a a PhD. And so- It's as close to rocket science as you can get. I mean, I I got a really good joke about that, by the way. And so uh, she did that at Pennsylvania State University, uh, the alma mater of my uh, sister's husband and um, under the leadership of Dr. Michael Pishko. And then um, she's also a gaucho. And the reason I know that she's a gaucho from the University of California, Santa Barbara, is because that's where my niece goes to school. Um, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So um, go gauchos, right? And yes. um, has been affiliated with Harvard Medical School Department of Ophthalmology on the mentorship of other doctors. She's published numerous papers. She's just really bright, obviously, and we're really excited to have you. So welcome and thank you very much for spending some time with us and helping educate our audience on skincare. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited. Awesome. Um, so you live in Dallas. Is that right? I do. I- I live in Dallas. Okay, that's and, correct. And so, have you um, have you ever eaten at Me Casino? Yes. Is it not the best margaritas you ever had in your life? I would say it's pretty good. Yes, right. I would agree. Oh wow! Yes. Or or Javier's. Those are two of our my wife. Javier's. Javier's. Javier's is my favorite. Yeah. That's the one I go to all the time. So my wife went to SMU. So we get to go to Dallas every once in a while and hang out with all our friends. And we always hit up that's Javier's. Amazing. And what's the name of that uh, Egyptian place that's pizza's amazing on Lovers? I don't know. 
Oh, I'll I don't think, think I've ever been there. We just always go to like Highland Park Village and Javier's we have to go to. And then the Cigar Lounge afterwards. It's pretty cool. All right. So let's start off with kind of a easy kind of straight down the middle. Campeses. Is that the name of it? Oh, my God. Really good. Um, tell us why someone should choose or what the difference between over-the-counter and medical-grade skincare is. Because we have some places, some med spas that really kind of trash talk um, medical-grade skincare. And so we, I'd love for you to be able to educate our patients and let them know just the difference in why medical-grade skincare is so important for patients. And then we'll kind of go over a typical regimen for patients, um, okay. if you don't mind. Perfect. Well, over-the-counter is is defined and regulated by the FDA. So anything that says over-the-counter medicine is a non-prescription medicine that is ordained by the FDA that should be safe, effective when consumers or patients, they're following the directions on the label of the package. And so OTCs um, have a place and you can see them with for example, you can have a toothpaste with fluoride, cough medicine, weight loss medicine, interestingly enough, acne medicine, and sunscreens. Those would all kind of fall in under FDA-regulated um, non-prescription medicine. Now, medical-grade skincare, actually, there is no regulation around it. And the definition will change from one company or brand to another. But what we have focus on in revision skincare for medical grade is that our products are formulated with maximum efficacy and they have rigorous, independent, non-biased clinical testing that show and prove to the patient and to the physicians and their staff there's these transformative benefits that support long-term skin health. So medical grade really doesn't have a pure definition and gotcha. it's not regulated by the FDA. Gotcha. So that's the, that's the difference. Okay. Yep. And so from a uh, fundamental standpoint, would you say that, that there is a difference in how strategic and how scientific one medical grade skincare company is from another? Like how does Revision try to differentiate itself from some of its competitors as far as getting to the market with concrete data and um, good science that that backs your formulas. Um, that's, that's that's great. Yeah. So revision. Well, we have a formulation philosophy that we. It's like our pillars, our gu our guardrails that we always try to abide by. And when we formulate, it really is for a broad patient population. And our innovations take about four to five years to come to market, since we spend so much time in the lab than running clinical studies. And a lot of our clinicals are performed with physicians, our key opinion leaders and in the space. And so what I think differentiates us is that we're not a me too product. Our, our products themselves are very disruptive and that they're really helping target an unmet need within your practice, for example, within the practices across the country and even internationally. And that really is what differentiates us. And additionally, I would say that we cons consistently publish um, in peer-reviewed journals, and we believe that's very important, especially because it's medical grade, and that's these products are for medicine and for the physicians and their patients. So we want to ensure that there is an acceptance by the medical community. That's great. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll definitely um, commend you for that, and also think that um, our local representative for your company here is always extremely knowledgeable about the science and uh, always presents it to our skincare department and the physicians here so that we all feel comfortable with why we give it to patients and why we recommend it to patients and things like that. So, so I have a question, though, Alisar. So I have always thought when you do your research, not only are you looking for efficacy and safety, but I thought you had to demonstrate that to the FDA, and you're kind of telling me my bubbles burst, you don't really have to do that. Not for medical-grade skincare, no. It actually is only only really OTCs, it's like for example, sunscreens have to be submitted to the FDA for approval. But the medical grade is based on utilizing ingredients that have high efficacy, and in the bare minimum you have to do in any in any brand or product is to run safety testing and micro testing, and that's just the bare minimum. 
But what we do is we, we do mechanism of action studies or understanding how a combination of ingredients together that we want to, we, the blend or the patent pending technology, how that is targeting different skin layers and how is that going to help um, provide, you know, a tar- it's just targeting an unmet need or how is it helping with, let's say, um, pigmentation? How are you targeting the melanin? And there's so many unique ingredients. And I think, again, with revision, myself and our chief scientific advisor, we've traveled around the world, her, her, herself, Tatiana, more than me, and looked at ingredients from suppliers from all over Asia and Europe. And we've ut- utilized high potent active ingredients and put them in the formulation. Now, in other countries, for example, Korea and Japan, there is a bucket called quasi-drug status that is I would say very similar to what a medical grade is, but we don't have that in the United States. Either you're a cosmetic or you're an OTC. And that's how the FDA distinguishes between the two. If there's a monograph that has rules on the ingredients that are allowed to be used versus a cosmetic that is supposed to beautify the skin. I'm sorry I burst your bubble on that, but that's well, the really, truth. I, I, I burst I, his bubble all the time. You don't have to apologize. And for I'm that. used to great. it. Yeah, he's totally used I to it. I almost enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, so if you <laughs> change your percentages of Retin-A uh, or hydroquinone, you don't have to prove they're safe all over again. That's uh, That would be true with an OTC product, but not with a medical grade product. Right. Well, you know, with hydroquinone, there was within the, in 2020, the FDA had, release their CARES Act and hydroquinone can no longer actually be um, sold over the counter. It has to be compounded at a pharmacy or part of the monograph as well. It can be compounded at a pharmacy for sure. And, so there's, and I guess I would tools. imagine that, that part of that regulation is that if something's sold over the counter, these patients can go grab it at Walgreens or Rite Aid. And so it, I can, can see how it would need to be more rigorously studied um, by the FDA than if it's in the hands of a physician, because what you would imagine is if you're getting medical grade skincare at a physician's office, that they know a lot more than uh, the consumer and That's would correct. only prescribe things that they felt comfortable prescribing, which so is So you would which is feel great. comfortable saying that the medical grade is stronger, more efficacious than what you could get OTC. Would that be true? I think that it would really, it would, I would say for certain products, yes. Like for example, our sunscreens that we have, our sunscreen moisturizers are, are the IntelliShade line. It's a sunscreen plus a moisturizer with anti-aging benefits. If I took that product, like IntelliShade True Physical, and I compared it to any sunscreen on the market, it's going to be so much more robust because it's clinically evident that it's helping with protecting and correcting skin damage from UVA, UVB, visible light, and IR. There's So I would say, yes, there's, depending on the classification, which products we're talking about, but with sunscreens, I would be very comfortable with that. Now, if you think about retinols and retinoic acid, we know that, you know, as physicians, you can write, you can write a, a, a script for retinoic acid, but you actually cannot formulate retinoic acid in a formula. Like FD will not allow that because that's a drug. That's like a drug that, you know, is required by the physician to write the prescription, but we can formulate with a retinol or retinol and those formulations could be very strong because we add in additional ingredients that can boost the efficacy. I don't think anybody's ever done, well, they've done studies with retinoic acid and retinol, but I don't think there's been a side-by-side comparison with other like OTCs versus medical grade. I don't believe there's been many studies like that, and I would have to look into that. I'm so happy that there are smarter people that are doing this than me. You know, I mean, there's, it's so, because there's so many different compounds, there's so many different ingredients, there's so many things. And I, I know, you know, it, for a lot of dermatology, plastic surgery offices, med spas, I mean, I, I don't know the numbers, but a, a large percentage of med spas are are not even owned by physicians, right? They're owned by somebody and then they've got a, a, a medical sponsor, basically, that right. just kind of oversees things and signs off on things and, you know, may or may not be in the building ever, but certainly... Um, uh, some of these things are are ordered through their physician license and their number and things like that. So um, 
I just, uh, I, I see a lot of those companies, those practices that then want to start their own skincare line, right? They say like, oh, let's start our own mm-hmm. skincare line. And they're not starting their own skincare line. They're going to a warehouse or some company that makes a ton of just kind of standalone um, formulas. It's chassis. Yeah. It's a formula yeah. or a chassis. And all they do is they can add in, they, they'll have a base and they'll say, okay, you could add this and this. but Sure. And, and put your logo on it. And put your logo right. on it, and then all of a sudden it's like, you know, Graper Harper Retinol is the best for some reason. And it yeah. just, it makes, I don't know. We just, I remember uh, Dr. Graper and I looked at each other one time, and we just said, man, there, there's so many brilliant people that are doing studies on this that are formulating these things with huge clinical studies and getting the right preparations. Why wouldn't we just kind of let the experts do it and then, you know, give that, offer that to our patients. And it just makes, it makes a heck of a lot more sense for us. And I think it works out for you all too, because revision, you know, recognizes you all as great partners. And I just want to mention that Dr. Harper, you've been recognized um, um, and handpicked from 12 um, different physicians. I mean, many physicians around the nation, but you're going to be featured in revision spotlight in April. So I want to say congratulations and thank you for your, you know, your partnership with our company. That's very yeah. kind. Yeah, I don't, well I, 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 thank you. I appreciate that. Must be because I, I use a lot of revision products, right? I think that you you're just, you need a lot you're, of revision products. I do, I do, <laughs> I do, I do, I do. That's certainly true. Certainly use yeah. them all the time. Yeah, and um, and like I said, we, uh, I personally um, use several revision products. So, I mean, the brightening facial wash I use twice a day and DEJ eye cream, I feel like it's a staple. I love that stuff. <laughs> I feel like it's, it's a staple. It's yeah. And so, um, and the sunscreen. Yeah. Sunscreen's good yep. too. And I, you know, admittedly, I don't, I'm not talking about a competitor, but like uh, we use a lot of Elta MD sunscreen too. And I know you're with Elta at one point too. And, and so that's great. But, yeah. So can, because sunscreen's such a big deal. Right. Like, Take 30 seconds and just kind of tell us why you feel Elta MD or Revisions sunscreen, one of these sunscreen, is a better option than going to Walgreens and grabbing some copper tone. I mean, I'll admit any sunscreen is better than none. But, Agree. But why, why would you – obviously, you guys formulate this and make this product, so you think it's superior. Otherwise, you wouldn't – bother with it. It's more expensive than copper tone or some of the other ones. So why should patients choose? Because sunscreen's a fundamental. I mean, I think if I had to tell somebody one thing, it's like my kids, we always talk about naked and afraid, right? That show where you can bring one thing (laughs) with you. And my kids are all like, I think I'd bring matches or, you know, my son's like, I may bring a knife or some machete or something like that. I saw the worst episode where this poor Lark got out there. He was all bodybuilder, studded up and all this kind of stuff. And he got out there and the sun baked him so bad that he had to tap out after the first day because he was sunburned. Oh, no. I was like, I don't yes, know. It's I'm, painful. Yeah, I'm pretty bad. Sure. I'm so white, I'm green sometimes. So I'm like, maybe I need to take some sunscreen with me to naked and afraid. But tell us why somebody should choose a medical grade, um, you know, you line that. for their sunscreen. Well, first, could I state that at the end of the day, the consumer or the patient is going to pay for the efficacy of the product and the end benefits that they're looking for. I mean, truly, and depending on it, you know, and that, of course, and what is recommended by the physician. But, you know, you mentioned copper tone. I say copper tone, Neutrogena banana boat. These are your sunscreens that are for the beach, for outdoor activities, for full body that are they have um, water resistance and they're just going to protect you from a sunburn. But if you're looking to up your ante and to have a form a product that's going to help with anti-aging benefits that has additional antioxidant protection on top of sunscreen and other factors, you'd go for Alta MD. And then with revision, we're a little step higher than Alta because we formulate with anti-aging peptides. We have a great blend of pre and postbiotics that are helping with the microbiome because there's a publication that has been shown that the microbiome on your skin can actually absorb UV raise and protect your skin furthermore from UV damage. So we we really do consider the microbiome and we have a whole plethora of additional ingredients that help with that. So at the end of the day, it's really 
Are you looking for a product that's going to help you with correct, protect, and reverse some sort of aging? You're going to go for a medical grade sunscreen. But if you want something just full body, you know, beach or outdoor activity, I would say, you know, maybe a copper toner Neutrogena would be okay. At least you're wearing sunscreen. Oh, yeah. I mean, that <clears throat> antioxidant, I think, is huge in addition to the, the protective effect of the sunscreen because some things going to get through and that antioxidant will modify that. Now, tell our listeners yeah. water-resistant versus water-repellent, uh, the actual definition. Yeah, because I, I find it interesting, right? Like, because uh, my wife is basically the, she's the the judge and the jury on whether or not we're doing sunscreen uh, enough when we're out on vacation or out of the beach or anything like that. And it's like, if it says, oh, you can go in the water with this and it's, you know, 90 minutes or whatever it is. And I swear to God, I feel like every 15 minutes she's telling me to put it on. Or once I go in, like, is that all like kind of not true and, and actually i would say she's correct you know why because most most humans we don't actually apply the right amount of um, sunscreen in our bodies and reapplication is key but mostly when you apply a product onto your body you're applying usually half of that so you're kind of getting half the dose of the spf so reapplication is important so if you're swimming and you come back and not swim and you're just drying up i would reapply too because you don't want to burn um but there are there, I, you know, my, my biggest pet peeve, and I'm sure that you guys don't mind me telling you this, is when 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 physicians say um, sunblock versus sunscreen, and then um, and then because it's a, there's no FDA changed the term, it's not sunblock, it's sunscreen, and then with water resistance, it's I would say water repellent, water resistance. There's nothing going to be fully water resistant. There's always a time frame, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, because the FDA has protocols. For these, you, we go to we work with different um, research organizations that actually put these patients in a water bath and they measure the efficacy of the sunscreen. They'll zap them with UV and UVB and they'll see after how much time does that sunscreen actually repel the water and protect the skin from burning. It's really interesting. Huh. And so I know that there's this is a complete generalization, but just so the audience kind of has an idea. Yes. Sometimes we see face sunscreen, body sunscreen, and then there are different SPFs, right? And so for, and, and skin tones, skin types, some people are more prone to, to burning than others. I get that. But what's a general kind of rule of thumb to go by for what sunscreens to use if you're out at the lake or out at your kid's soccer game or on the beaches of Ibiza or some great place that <laughs> Graper will go to and I'll probably never be able to see, but you know. What's a general kind of <laughs> gestalt for that? Is there any difference between face and body? Does it matter? Um, I don't think so. I think it's as long as you have a minimum of SPF 30. Like, for example, I know I work at Revision and I'm talking about these products, but there's other products, too, that you know, that could be for the face, but you could purchase a larger size and have it for the body. Intel Shade Clear. I think it's a perfect product that could be used for body and face because it goes on so nicely. It's easy to spread on the skin. So I think it's all about also the formulation and how it feels. And it's just a preference of the patient. Like they may not want um, a truly physical sunscreen on their body. They just want it on their face. So there's, there's options and there's a, you know, a few companies that are sold, you know, medical grade that have great options for the consumer and their patient. I've always kind of said, uh, I mean, I used to wash my face with like dial soap, right? I mean, maybe. <laughs> and so I remember when I started here nine, 10 years ago, um, Graper's always adopted it. So I applaud you for that. I mean, that guy um, is very knowledgeable about skincare and was always doing things, which I kind of looked up to and was like, I don't know a lot of guys that take care of their skin well. Um, and so I have tried to start doing that. But I've always kind of told all the skincare places, guys aren't going to take like five, six, seven steps, right? I mean, I go into my yeah. my bathroom right now and I look over at my wife's counter and it, it, it's a, it makes no me nervous. Counters. It makes me nervous. It makes me nervous. Like I, there's so many skincare and granted she's married to a plastic surgeon. So that's one perk, probably <laughs> the only perk that she would tell you, but that is one perk. And so she knows how to navigate all that kind of stuff. But let's right. let's get guys off the table. What are it, the essentials? What are the essentials for a dude? And I know the crazy question that people always ask is, well, when do I start it? 
I'm 25 years old. I'm 30 years old. And is, 35 and, years you old. Know, skincare really different for men and women? Yeah. I don't think so. Yeah, I know. I don't. I don't think it's different. I mean, just the skin on the on the face of a man is a little bit thicker and different than a woman. But you're just gonna you just do different clinicals, and you but the same product can be used. I could tell you that essentially what I've learned in being here at Revision and speaking to physicians like yourselves, um, that the bare minimum would be a vitamin C, a vitamin A, and a sunscreen, bare minimum. And there are, and yeah, so vitamin C is a great product, antioxidant protection. And then you can use a vitamin A, like a retinol or retinol, like in the evening. And then of course, sunscreen. So that could be something very simple. If um, uh, a male consumer patient wants more details, a moisturizer in the winter, um, the beauty about revision is that we can actually mix our products together. There's synergy with the formulation. We formulate so they can be combined together in one step. So you just pump the products together and you mix it on your face. And then the last step is sunscreen and then you're out of the house. So we try to reduce the complexity, especially. So like the brightening facial wash, I love. And I use that. um, Yeah, I take two showers, one before I go to bed and one when I wake up in the morning. And I use it in, in both circumstances. Right. Um, and then at nighttime, before I go to bed, I'll use the DEJ eye cream, right? Okay, great. And then admittedly, I don't really do a moisturizer sunscreen during the day. That's probably bad, <gasps> isn't it? I know, it's terrible. Well, but you're in the OR all day. That's true. I mean, in your defense. <laughs> that's true. I don't really get to see the sunlight. Yeah, 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 yeah dark. that's true. Kind of like a gremlin. But what, you're right. but what if you're driving in the during the day because you know UVA and blue light gets through those your window. True, your which I also think yes. is interesting. Good fact for everybody to know that men get more skin cancers on the left side of their face and women get more skin cancers on the right side of their face. Do you know why? Driving versus passenger. That's exactly right. Isn't that crazy? Wow. Isn't that wild? That is crazy. I know. That's, yeah. I know. I know. Probably a little outdated, but that's just fundamentally, that's, that's a true thing. Um, it's true. I mean, one in five one in five people will have skin cancer and it's just, and I think it's, it's, it's still growing. It's kind of crazy how in the United States it's not, it's not being tapered off by any, by any means. I, I I took a skin cancer off of a friend today. As a matter of fact, she is 35 years old, absolutely beautiful. um, And like, it's just basal cell. Yeah. But I mean, it doesn't matter. No Aldera? No. This was, you know, cosmetically sensitive. I don't think she wanted to rub the Aldera on there and walk around like she had a couple of. She'd rather have a big scar. <laughs> crazy lesions wow. or anything like that. Right, right, right. Huge fan of Aldera. I love this. Yeah, yeah. Every once in a while, every couple of months, Graper will rub that all over his head. I'm getting ready to do it again. Looks too, like so get ready. Looks like he's got some crazy lesions on there and then they yeah. fall off and then they're fine, which is great. Well, kind of two more points, and then we won't keep right. you any longer. But, you know, one, I want you to talk about this new product that you were mentioning yes. um, at the start of this, because this is something that Revision um, has come out within the last couple months, which is great. So tell us about it. Yes, I would love to. Actually, we just launched it at the end of January, okay. so it's really new. Okay. It's called CMT Post Procedure Cream where C stands for chemical, M stands for mechanical, and T for thermal. We found that there was an unmet need post-care for most procedures, and this was a a request. And by procedures, you mean lasers, you mean microneedling, you mean all the- Microneedling, chemical peels, microneedling, and thermal, especially with laser treatments where there's a lot of heat and there's some downtime. So we have been working on this for four and a half years, and- we um, have run several clinical case studies across the gamut of procedures, chemical, mechanical, and thermal. And the product is a neurocosmetic. So it's a really new category, super disruptive. Neurocosmetics are, ingre- are products that contain ingredients that communicate the skin with the brain. So the skin has, sens- has receptors, the both sensory neurons and keratinocytes within your skin have receptors for mechanical, thermal, and chemical. So if you think about it, if I take my hand, which I would never do that, but put it on the stove and I burnt my hand, um, there was a connection between the, like I have a, my hand touches a stove. I can feel that there is heat there. 
And that signals to the brain that you need to move your hand and you're going to have pain or discomfort. So these neurocosmetics are ingredients that have, are coming from really unique um, sources, botanical extracts that are called extremophiles. They're growing in conditions that are extremely uh, dangerous or high temperatures or within the sea and depths that are super cold. And we have created a product that can help patient relief, so patient discomfort, and also recovery by rebuilding the barrier, the epidermal barrier, and as well as the microbiome. And so I think it'd be great for your practice as well, because, you know, doing procedures and helping with that recovery. But the key to it is that patients have identified that it's not that they don't want to pay for the treatment series. It's that there, there's a fear of the downtime and of the pain. So we're helping with that relief so your patients can come back to complete their treatment series. So we're really excited about it. I'm yet to have a patient ask, not ask me about downtime, which is um, – so that's great that you guys are on the on the cutting edge of, of trying to – ameliorate some of those concerns, which is awesome. All right. One more question. Uh, yes. you know, a listener asked this, um, to the doc dudes, uh, talking about CO2 lasering, which has become, I guess, popular again over the last year. It used to be the CO2 lasers. Um, you know, if I just remember a, a, a practice that I, um, trained under in Atlanta, used to have a CO2, and they said that, you know, they would do kind of perioral treatments for patients to get some of the the lines out, and those people would walk around like and look like ventriloquist dummies, like mannequins, because um, they'd have this demarcation of their, you know, difference in their skin tones after from the areas that were treated. And so I know all the laser companies went to, uh, went back to work and tried to figure out how to do a CO2 laser that wouldn't do that same kind of demarcation. But... You know, what's the best kind of treatment for deep lip lines, like that area around the mouth? Um, and, you know, I know that some of the CO2 lasers, obviously that's what they went back to the, the, the drawing board to figure out how to make a device that didn't leave them with that. Uh, I, would, I would say I, I tend to tell patients to, if they're going to do a peel, do your whole face. Like there's no reason just to do one, one area. But, um, you know, what's your feeling on CO2 lasers? Obviously, it sounds like maybe this product would be ideal for post-CO2 lasers, the new product that you guys have. But It would be perfect for post-CO2. We've looked at um, hybrid fractional, fractional ablative, and fully ablative. So we're working through um, the fully ablative. But this would be really great, especially around the mouth area. Isn't that very painful? I know when I get my upper like lips area like lasered i'm like i i squirm it's so painful yeah so, i mean we've yeah, done dental blocks great. on patients before where you go in through the mouth and oh yeah uh, yeah and do that. Uh, doctor would you say that this new product would be just as good for chemical peels it would be right yep for chemical peels as well so anything that's destroying the uh, j dej junction dej uh it's that's going to be helpful Yes, it, it, it's helpful for any patient that has irritation, whether it's stinging, burning, dryness, um, and then it's going to help with soothing those senses. It's very like emotional in, because of the relief part with the neurocosmetic. And then the recovery, it's rebuilding the barrier. The formulation very much is, has a base that's similar to the lipids in your skin. So you're helping rebuild the barrier and you're also we helping need some the microbiome now. survive. Now. Can you put it on? So you can put it on for the skin that's raw, right? As it's healing. It, yes. Um, well, we also, it could be raw, but you'd also want to add an extra occlusive in your protocols if you already have that as your standard of care, especially when you have fully ablative because it's a semi-breathable, semi-breathable um, formulation. So so if we put would, that on first and then some, well, I mean, frequently you just use Aquaphor. Aquaphor, uh, Would that yes. work? That, I, that's what we're looking at right now. I believe that would work. And I'd love it for you to try it and let us know. Yeah, we'd love to. No, so, and then after it's epithelialized, do you have a favorite product in your line that uh, we should be using? Yeah. Yes, the DJ Daily Boosting Serum, such a game changer, with, which is focusing on boosting mitochondrial energy because we know that the rate limiting step for everything in our lives is energy. And as we age, our mitochondria are not as efficient in creating energy. So this product is so good in helping with that, um, like post-reepithelialization, helping the patients 
get in between the next series of treatments. It's great. Say that I mean, name one more time because I have not been familiar with it. I'm, you're teaching me. The DEJ. No, I know DEJ, but the, 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 the product the, name. Oh, the new one. Da the Daily Boosting Serum. Daily Boosting it. Serum. After yes. the, after the uh, in our case, the peel is re -epithelialized. That's what we should be using. Yes. after Usually after three days, then you can switch into the boosting serum. And that would be great to have. It's very thin. It's a it's, it's really wonderful. And the data on that, I mean, I can spend hours with you talking to you about why that product itself is medical grade. It's just really unique data. Well, that's good because that we done. frequently do deep peels for those lines around the mouth that are right. you know, 7, 10, even 14 days where they haven't re because they're that deep. So I'm excited to try this product. It's awesome. Well, listen, we want to thank Dr. Alice Arzar, who is in Dallas, Texas, and hopefully we'll go to Javier's tonight. Um, Javi Javier's is so good. But I really appreciate you both. Both Dr. Harper. And oh, Dr. Harper you were awesome. Thank, Thank you, you so Amazon. much. And, you know, to the audience, you. if you have any questions or topics you want us to cover, visit uh, our uh, webpage, www.ghsurgery.com, and click on the Doc Dudes from the homepage. There's a link to click to submit your questions and ideas. You can also listen to all of the Doc Dudes episodes on our website, as well as Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or anywhere else you listen to your favorite podcasts. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook to find out when new episodes drop and other information about our practice. This is uh, Garrett Harper and Bob Graper signing out, right? Thanks, man. That was fun. Yeah, man.